hello, welcome. This is Career Conversation, Careers in um, Development and Fundraising. And I am going to allow each of our panelists to introduce him or herself. So why don't we just get started and we're going to go down the table this way. So we're starting with Jen. Hi everyone, um, my name is Jenna Ricciardi. I am a NU alum, I graduated in 2011. Um, and I currently work at Fenway Health, and my title is Development Coordinator. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Fenway, and then a little bit about what I do, and afterwards, your questions for free. Um, so I started working there about two and a half years ago as a co-op student, actually. Um, it's a marketing co-op, um, and I worked there full-time for six months. I really liked it. I learned a lot. I had a little bit of fundraising experience in the past at a different nonprofit organization that I volunteer for and then um, stayed on. But basically what Fenway is, is a community health center. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, we have four locations in Boston. I work at the largest one. It's on Boylson Street near Fenway Park. Um, and we treat about 20,000 people in the city of Boston and about beyond. We provide primary health care, dental optometry, pharmacy, specialty, behavioral health care bunch of different things, but we also have a special focus on LGBT health and health disparities in the LGBT population. So in addition to providing health services, we provide a bunch of unique health services like transgender health care, um, insemination for lesbian couples, um, programs like that that are a little bit more progressive and because of that we also get involved in a lot of research, education, and advocacy work. In my department, the development department, it's only about 10 people, so it's very small, it's very team-oriented feeling to it. Um, everyone has a unique role. There's nobody doing, no two people doing the same thing, so you really feel like you're making an impact and you have a unique role there. Um, when I started, I was working on um, asking local businesses and individuals to donate to our silent auction. We have two very large fundraising galas in spring. Each one draws well over a thousand people. Um, they're major components of our fundraising calendar. And so I was working with volunteer committees from the community, um, outreach to businesses, lots of phone calls, lots of database entry work. Um, and then as I continued to work there, um, new opportunities opened up. I've been really lucky that my um, supervisors have sort of always challenged me every time I feel like I'm really getting a handle on my job, something really big and new comes along, which is awesome. Um, so the things that I work on now, um, I co-manage our Young Leaders Council, which is a group of um, people in their 20s and 30s who donate about $25 a month or $300 for the year. And in exchange, we pr provide different social and educational opportunities for them. So what we do is basically plan events, um, usually monthly, and it's a great way for me to get involved more with the community, and I have a steering committee for this Young Leaders Council that I manage, so that gives me an opportunity to be working with a volunteer committee, with community members who care about what we're doing, um, and kind of serve them and what their needs are, what they would like to see in terms of events, and learning more about our organization, and really building strong relationships with those donors. Um, for the long term. And then the other thing that I do, uh, which I just started recently, about six months ago, is I plan a charity bike ride. Um, it's called Harbor to the Bay. It goes from Boston to Provincetown, the end of Cape Cod. It's about 125 miles. Okay. I'm Christopher Kelly. I graduated in 2010. I work in prospect research at uh, the Harvard University Development Office. My, my group is about, so we handle most of the schools at Harvard, except the business school, the med school, school of public health, the law school, um, I forget anyone. they all have their own prospect research offices. So what we do is we identify um, people who um, have wealth and we want to make them donors, or we want to increase the amount that they can give, um, and kind of gauge what their giving capacity is. And we do that in a lot of ways, and my job specifically is much more kind of task oriented. So each of the 18 people in my office, they all have periodicals that they read um, and they go through them and you know kind of pick out names and say, this person sounds interesting, let's look to, look to see if they're a Harvard alum or if they're in our databases having given. Um, 
and then kind of go from there. So we look at we'll look at things magazines like Wired, but we'll also look at things that are more wealth centric, like um, Forbes or New York Times. We'll look in the business section, things like that. Um, and then it's also we get paired up with uh, fundraisers that go around the country, and so they will they will hear from other alumni who live in the area, or um, other alumni that live in the area, or just from knowing the area and say, this person sounds interesting, you know, we don't really know that much about them except for they, they live in this house or they work at this company as a managing director, can you find us more information so that we can Go, when we go and meet them that we already know a certain amount of information and know how to approach them. Um, so we'll do that and then we also, if the president of Harvard or someone has an event and it's specifically geared towards a certain initiative or a certain group of people, we will, they'll know some of the people to invite, but if they need to flesh out that and you know, kind of bring younger people into the mix or people that they haven't seen before, We'll just kind of, we'll go through certain databases that we have, certain resources, and say, hey, you might be interested in these people, here are quick bios on them, um, tell me what you think. So I've been there about a year, a little less than a year and a half now, and it's very interesting, there's always something to do every day. I don't, I don't really have, I don't have any face-to-face -face interaction with donors, um, but I have face-to-face -face interaction with you know, provost or president of Harvard, and then definitely the fundraisers who are frontline meeting with uh, developers. And it's interesting because, you know, as much as I'm not going in there and saying, hey, we'd really like you to donate a million dollars, what do you think? And then they do it. I do get to see, you know, someone who we didn't know anything about them. And then as time kind of goes on, you know, they'll give a million dollar gift and then they'll give a $10 million gift. And it's interesting to see people come through the pipeline like that. Uh, my name is Nikki. I graduated from Northeastern in 2005, and I studied communications and music. And then I went to Northeastern Law School from 2006 to 2009. And I, um, I took the bar exam, which I passed in 2009. But uh, after graduation, I decided to take uh, a year to do an AmeriCorps VISTA uh, year of service. And so I started working at Zoomix, which is a, a youth development and community arts organization in East Boston. And the bulk of the programming we do is after school and summer music and creative technology programming for youth. But we also do in-school partnerships and we do community arts programming in East Boston. And I started at Zoomix as a, a VISTA and a grant writer. I was the first full-time development staff person at the organization. And I worked under a consultant who had been doing a lot of development work for Zoomix. And within the first year, as I started doing the grant writing, you know, it became evident pretty quickly that it wasn't entirely a full-time position. And so I started getting to do a lot of work uh, with events and individual giving as well. Um, and that would be, you know, planning things like the Walk for Music, um, working on the annual appeal letters and things like that. And, um, you know, I, I will say that I think that the VISTA year was a great experience, and so I'll just give a separate plug for that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, after the panel if people have questions about VISTA. You know, it's kind of a, a trade-off, but I think it's pretty worth it. You know, you do get a fairly low stipend for the work that you do, but you get to do work that is beyond an entry-level position. Um, and, you know, for a nonprofit organization that hopefully is doing work that you really care about. Um, so I will say uh, VISTA was a good experience. And, you know, it was also a good way to, uh, to segue that work into, you know, a, a real job because at the end of the year I did get hired by Zoomix um, and I started uh, then working as a development manager. Kind of just taking on a little more responsibility. I started working with our fundraising committee and our finance committees at that time and so I've gotten to know the board members very well. And uh, about a year and a half into my time at Zoomix, we hired a grant writer to take over the work that I had been doing so that I could focus um, 
a lot more of my energies onto individual giving and fundraising events. And so we do um, the Walk for Music, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's a sponsorship walk. We do a 5K. We do um, ticketed events. We do a jazz week. Uh, so it's been a, a very good variety in that area. I've also um, managed a few giving campaigns. I've been able to work with larger donors, um, people who are giving at the $1,000 level or above. Uh, my name is Trisha Keck. I graduated from Northeastern in 2005. I studied um, journalism and had a concentration in public relations and did a minor in business. Um, through a variety of co-ops, I kind of found a niche that I really enjoyed, which was um, nonprofit event planning. Um, and now work at Big Brothers Big Sisters. I'm the director of their fundraising events and have worked there for four years. Um, my responsibilities there are I manage a team of four others that are in charge of planning the events that we have. Uh, we raise about $2 million is our goal this year to raise through seven um, larger events. Um, the goals of our events are not only fundraising, but cultivating new donors and stewarding the existing donors that we have. Um, so it takes a full team to kind of execute all of the logistics, fundraising, volunteer management that go into um, to pulling off these events. Um, they range from small golf tournaments to a million dollar concert event that we put on. Um, really we're just trying to attract and um, get exposure to as many people in the community as we can. Um, Big Brothers Big Sisters is a well recognized national brand, um, but we really try to connect locally with people. We're the largest um, local mentoring organization, so it's important that we have lots of ties and roots and stuff in Boston. Um, the team, like I said, manages everything from sim a lot of similar things that other people are doing, which is um, managing auctions, um, managing volunteer event committees. Um, they're in charge of you know, following up and securing sponsors and revenue. Um, and then we kind of do all of the logistics and chaos that goes into planning um, a fundraising event. My, my immediate office is 18 people, and I would say that they've come from a lot of different backgrounds. I would say probably around 40% of them actually have a master's degree in library science, and they either worked in a business setting or a legal setting and came from that, knowing how to use um, certain databases that they can apply to this. I would say the rest of the people, I was at a law firm before I came here as a paralegal. There are definitely a few of those, and I think there are a few people who have come from just a complete business background at like Goldman or Bain and then have moved into prospect research. Uh, I think analytical skills are very are very important because you need to look at all of the assets that we can see for an individual, whether it be based on um, certain financial forms that have been submitted or whether it just be, you know, figuring out the price of their house and seeing whether or not that's off based on the zip code or if most of the time see their house because it will be on Zillow. Mm -hmm. um, and just other things. So I think balancing all of that and saying, you know, I don't think I'm getting the complete picture, or I think I am, I think that that takes some analytical skills. And writing, I'm sure. Too. Yep, and then you writing the bios and presenting it to the fundraiser in sometimes an eloquent, eloquent way, mm. I think is important. Um, and one thing that we also do that I didn't mention is we also do due diligence on people. Um, so if they are saying, okay, we want to donate $10 million to do, you know, a center on domestic abuse, but it turns out that they've been in the newspaper for domestic abuse, then you don't necessarily want to take their money. Um, I found a pretty fruitful way to find foundation funders is to look at the annual reports of similar organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, may sound a little underhanded, but it's totally legit. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a good way to find out what the funder is interested in. And, you know, I do that with a lot of Zoom Exist sister organizations, and I feel like the thought in the sector is that if a foundation can support one of us, they can support both of us. Mm -hmm. And so I also find that people are generally open to talking about it and giving advice with funders as well. Um, but I've pretty much stopped using things like the Foundation Center because I just had better luck with annual reports.
Sure. So I actually was a psychology major and a business minor in, in undergrad, and I had no real uh, thought about development until basically my senior year. I, but I did volunteer intensively for a separate nonprofit organization that hosts leadership conferences for students. So I was already volunteering major, major hours while I was in college, and part of that included me sending annual appeal letters to my family and friends and people I knew in the community asking them to donate to this place. And when I was really young, I mean, I was doing this in high school too, I was so super passionate about it, I loved doing it, I thought it made so much sense. Um, and then, basically it came through the co-op system, I was searching for co-op jobs, I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go, I was thinking about working in higher education, I was thinking about working in event planning. My previous jobs had to do with event planning. Um, but when I started working at Fenway, I thought it just made sense because I knew I had a little bit of fundraising experience, um, similar kind of going out into the community asking for support from businesses, small businesses. And then I kind of just jumped into it. And when I was graduating, I, when I had six months left, I was thinking, what do I want to do, you know, and I just kind of clicked for me, nonprofits is has to be where I work. I like the direct community impact. I've always felt strongly about how money should be used and thought, well, I want to have an influence on um, where that excess money goes or making sure that some funding is going to the things that I feel strongly about. <coughs> so before I was at Harvard, I was at a law firm. Before that, I was still in school and I was a uh, senior class president, so I helped with the senior gift and I think, you know, I was interested in higher ed and I was interested in development and I think, I think, you know, the real choice that I had earlier is I was applying for different internships in Boston and I had applied to a couple of development jobs um, and was a finalist for a really cool one at the MFA that I was excited for. and. I also got a internship offer. The boss would have been my friend, um, and he, it was at the Joint Committee on Revenue at the State House. So it was an interesting job too. So I ended up going with that, and I think that had I gone straight to the MFA, I probably would have been doing development straight out of college. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I think I applied to some higher ed, some entry level development jobs when when I graduated, but I think that I was just applying to lots of jobs. I don't think that I was, you know, solely applying for that. So when the time came, so I actually got laid off from the law firm because um, during the recession, litigation as a whole wasn't going super well. So I spent about two months unemployed, and I said, you know what, I think this is the time to apply to jobs that I'm super interested in versus applying to things that maybe I know I'm not so interested in. And that, for me, that was definitely being a paralegal again. I knew that I probably didn't want to do that. Law school probably wasn't in the cards. I actually started Northeastern as a music industry major. And um, within the first year, I kind of realized that it wasn't going to take me quite where I wanted to go, and so I switched to communications. Um, I was at Northeastern during the transition from trimesters to semesters, and so I did um, two co-ops, but they were six months each. And the first one I did was at an organization called From the Top, which is um, a, commu or, um, a radio program for youth musicians. It's actually right up the street on Huntington. And it was a pretty small nonprofit. Um, it's grown quite a bit since then. But I think that one of the benefits of doing a co op at a small nonprofit, which I absolutely recommend, is that you will get to see what everyone does there. Um, and so even if you're doing your co-op in communications, like you're going to see what the financial person does. You know, I got to work with the, uh, the show producer and things like that, so it was a very wide range. And, you know, it was kind of the, uh, the introduction as, to development as a possibility. Um, and I did my second co-op at Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. And that was um, the point at which I decided to go to law school. And while I was in law school, I, I did four co-ops because I, I went to Northeastern as well um, in a variety of places. But it, it became clear at that time that I really wanted to be doing 
nonprofit work um, or legal services. Uh, I've only worked for three months in my life at a for-profit company, and I'm not looking to go back. It was a <laughs> it was a rough three months. So uh, at the end of law school, um, I graduated in 2009. You know, it was a it was a tough year to look for work. And so I decided to do um, the VISTA service for many reasons. You know, I, I genuinely did want to volunteer for a year. Um, I felt like it would be a good time for me. I knew that I was going to be a competitive person to get hired. And um, I think that I kind of got lucky in finding Zoomix because it was an organization that fit well for me personally. Um, but silly as it sounds, I will say what happened anyway. Um, when I applied for the, through the VISTA portal, you can only apply for 10 jobs at a time. And Zoomix was at the end of the alphabet. And so, <laughs> honest to God, like five people applied. Um, you know, like Action for Community Development, I'm sure had like 50 or 60 applicants. But, I mean, that's the truth of the matter. So, don't overlook the end of the alphabet ever. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, they ended up interviewing two people and um, they chose me, I think, because um, they felt like I was a better personal fit. And, um, you know, I've been involved in a few of the hiring processes at Zoomix. So I, I think I've gotten a pretty good insight in how employers screen resumes and cover letters and things like that. I've had to do it a few times myself. Um, but what I can say is, you know, once you get to the interview stage, even if it's just a phone interview, um, that they're really just looking to see who's going to fit in there. And so I was lucky because I, I found an organization that I was a good fit for. Uh, I unexpectedly uh, landed in development. I thought that in college I was passionate about writing. I knew that I didn't want to be a journalist, so that's what kind of brought me to going down the route of public relations. I uh, did my first co-op at a PR firm, uh, then I my second one was at a radio station in their marketing department, um, writing what people said on air um, for like promo spots, for ads, um, for local public, you know, things that the radio was doing in the community. Uh, and then my third job was for a um, private consulting development events company. So it was really small, it had about five employees and they were looking for someone with some strong writing skills. Um, and so I ended up being a great fit for it. I worked there, like I said, for my last co-op. During my senior year, I worked there part-time, and then they offered me a job when I graduated, and I stayed there for about three years. Um, I really enjoyed it because I got to work with a range of nonprofits. So a nonprofit, for example, Children's Hospital, um, would hire them to manage um, an event that they had because they didn't want to pay a full-time employee all of the benefits and everything that went along with it, so they did pop-up things where they would hire us for one event for one year and then we did this for multiple nonprofits around the city. So from really small nonprofits in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where if they raised forty thousand dollars they were over the moon to Children's Hospital who raised five million dollars. So I had um, a portfolio of clients that I did this for throughout the year. Um, at times I would be maybe working with up to three different nonprofits um, on a variety of different things. Some I would be managing their um, event fundraising committees, some would just want help setting up the logistics of the hotel and what the, how the flow for the guests were going to be. Um, so it really was a wide range. Um, I got to learn a ton about how small nonprofits manage themselves, um, how their development departments work, how their marketing teams work to then, like I said, larger organizations like a children's hospital. Um, what I loved about it was that I kind of got my foot in everything. I was a really um, you know, active role in each of the events in all different capacities. The part that I felt was missing was that I would only work with these clients for, say, four months, once a year. So I would build these great relationships, I would start really getting this dialogue back and forth with the donor that they had, or an auction donor, or a volunteer um, event committee person, and then once the event was over, the relationship disappeared and didn't come up again until this time again next year. Um, so I said that's kind of really what I'm lacking is to build these standing relationships with um, non people who are passionate about nonprofits. So I um, was interested in leaving there and then going to work directly for a nonprofit, um, which was you know definitely an adjustment. And Big Brothers Big Sisters um, was where I landed. So I've um, enjoyed being able to build lasting relationships. For this job, there was no networking involved. For other jobs where I got interviews, there probably were. Actually, what I found 
is that a lot of the jobs um, I was applying for, some of them being here, you know, they had co-ops, the co-ops were graduating, they kind of wanted them, but they were also interviewing other people, but it was up to me to kind of wow them, and I think that's difficult to do for entry-level or mm -hmm. just above entry-level jobs. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, there were a lot of people who I found were long-term temps in the position that they wanted to hire. Mm -hmm. um, so I think networking is important. I've helped other people that I graduated with that I think would be great, like one person who went on a lot of dialogues to civilization and she worked in a lot of different countries on co-op, um, an international advancement job opened up at my office, so I immediately contacted her. And I think, you know, there have been a couple times where on my Facebook status I put, there's a job opening if anyone's interested in. Um, but I think definitely, you know, targeting places you think you might like to work, but also looking at places like Idealist or other websites that have smaller places um, that you might have never heard of. The I you know just applied from like an Idealist posting. I um, submitted my resume online, but I also did um, priority mail my resume and my cover letter. Um, I don't know. I never asked if that stood out, but I just was trying to kind of make my resume not just get lost in the shuffle of the million emails. Um, Somebody's got to sign for someone's it. Someone's got to sign for it, and um, you know with the resumes I get now. Uh, for jobs that I'm trying to fill, I get so many emails that it could just be one thing that I just keep rushing through the email. So I was trying to find a way to stand out. Um, I also was familiar with a lot of the donors that they had. I had worked with many of the donors um, in the community, so I kind of had a good sense of who are the players who are who are donating a lot to local nonprofits. Um, who are their networks? I was familiar. I familiarized myself as much as I could with local names. I was reading Boston Magazine, The Globe. I was knowing like what companies were really philanthropic, um, the, like the key names. And in Boston, it, it is a small city, mm -hmm. so you can know the key players. And I'm sure we all maybe have, you know, donors in local nonprofits that are many of the same names. They give to the same organizations. And I had worked with them at the other nonprofits that I had helped. Um, you know, as they were my clients, and they kind of were many crossovers with the with um, the board members and committees that Big Brothers Big Sisters had. So just kind of that familiarity, and um, I had had experience planning small events to large events. So I kind of had the experience in the wide range of events that they did, and um, and I was passionate about you know working hard and events and. It is not a job that um, it's a not a nine to five job, and for a lot of people's lifestyles, that's not okay. I think that um, you know, in every nonprofit's a little bit different. For Big Brothers Big Sisters, the special events, um, although we're doing the logistics that go along with it, a large part of our job is the development and the do stewardship um, and cultivation of donors. Um, they just happen to be. Um, for to benefit events. Um, so I think that you can really, if you can focus on building individual relationships and um, kind of getting down, you know, like your pitch, and like we were talking about what you do for the young professionals, it's really how you're going to sell, um, sell what the cause is, you know, get people passionate and behind um, what you're doing as a development person. Um, but I think that events is a great stepping stone for going into development as being a development officer because you have to have the relationships first. I mean, I think any local large nonprofit, they're not hiring a development officer that doesn't have contacts existing already. Uh, we, we have these two huge fundraising galas in the spring, and so those each have volunteer event committees, um, and those are usually made up of donors. You know, these people kind of double as volunteers, but also donors. So I build relationships with them, kind of helping them to ask businesses to donate to our auctions. Um, so. Through that, I've made relationships with these event committees, um, and I think you kind of leverage that relationship to increase their giving mm -hmm. to your organization. So if you like those events, if you like the social thing, I'm definitely not a 9 to 5 person. I usually work at least one night a week at a volunteer meeting or an event of some kind. So that has <laughs> been, if you like events like that, it's definitely fun. If you like socializing with people and building those relationships, yeah, I would say focus on building the relationships and then you can get into that. Because you might be their strongest connection to the organization as the manager of the event committee or, or whatnot. Field-wise, I think that people are pretty supportive um, and are willing to mentor you. And I think if, the, if you go to 
you know, your boss, or if you go to a development office, officer and say, hey, I'm really interested in this, would you be willing to sit down with me and talk about it? Or go to your boss and say, hey, I'm kind of interested in these things, do you think that you know, we can explore my job responsibilities to see if that kind of goes up? And I think, you know, worst case scenario, they say no, which I would mostly be surprised if they did. But, I mean, if that's the situation, then I think that there are also places that you can go to to volunteer time. So if I ever wanted, you know, as a prospect researcher to go into development and I couldn't really do that at Harvard, I feel like I could come to Northeastern and say, hey, you know, I have development experience doing this, but I'd be happy to volunteer a certain amount of time to doing maybe not frontline, frontline, but something more closely related to it. I think that people, you would find that people were pretty open. I actually think they're pretty different personalities. I think that people are frontline. Um, you know, they enjoy they enjoy dealing with people, especially who are people who are passionate. But at least for Harvard, where you know the gifts are going to be a larger amount, and um, you know, like there are there are some acts that take you know years in the making, and it will be a five year process, sometimes a ten year process. Um, so that they'll donate two hundred million dollars. Like to go for that, to go for that ask, you know, is a, there's a certain amount of adrenaline, and I think that that attracts people like that. And for me, it's much more, you know, it's much more analytical. And you know, if you're excited about googling something and finding some obscure thing on the internet, that's the type of person who just prospects. Um, it's um, through the College of Professional Studies. Mm -hmm. It's a Master's of Science in Nonprofit Management. So it sort of mixes some classes that are considered nonprofit management classes, which are very basically business classes, but they're specific to nonprofits. So they're like finan financial management for nonprofits, um, public like marketing and public relations for nonprofits, governance, legal governance, and board management. Mm -hmm. And then there's some other classes that are required in leadership and in communications, and you kind of mix them all together. And grant writing classes? There is a grant writing class, there's a fundraising and development class.